Joining us now on the line from Los Angeles, California, Lawrence C. Smith. He is professor of geography at UCLA and the author most recently of The World in 2050, Four Forces Shaping Civilization's Northern Future. Lawrence, it's good to meet you. How are you tonight? Very well. Thanks for having me on the show, Steve. Not at all. I gather when you started researching your book, you were planning to research the impact of climate change in general. However, what you discovered was uh, more impactful than just what would happen to the North. Let's start to unpack that. What'd you find? Sure, yeah, that, that's absolutely right. I started off the project, I'm a climate scientist, so I went up to the far north uh, looking to study the impacts of climate change on northern peoples. But when I got there, I, I quickly learned there's a lot more going on than climate change, uh, in addition to climate change, particularly uh, energy development, but also in the case of Canada, of course, uh, the um, Inuit and uh, First Nations, uh, political empowerment, and so on. There, there are a lot of big transformative changes underway around the northern world. I want to read an excerpt from your book, and then we'll chat a little bit more. The northern quarter of our planet's latitudes, you write, will undergo tremendous transformation over the course of this century, making them a place of increased human activity, higher strategic value, and greater economic importance than today. I loosely define this new north as all land and oceans lying 45 degrees north latitude or higher currently held by the United States, Canada, Iceland, Greenland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. Okay, you call these countries the NORCs, N-O-R-C-S. Uh, what in the new world, uh, half a century from now, do you think will make them so particularly much more important than they are today? Well, um, I focus especially on four global forces which are um, worldwide in nature. Uh, these are the global forces of population demography. Uh, these are immigration, age structures, uh, and, and other aspects of population, um, natural resource demand, globalization, and climate change. So put simply, people, trade, resources, and climate have always uh, driven the course of human history and will continue to do so in the future. How is the impact of global warming on the North different than on the rest of the world? Well, the, in the far north, in the Arctic, um, there's a peculiar amplification of climate change uh, due to the ice, sea ice albedo feedback and another number of other feedbacks as well. So it, even if the global mean average increase in temperature is, say, plus 2 degrees C, uh, it will be at least double that in the far north. Uh, this will have ramifications for countries like Canada uh, leading to a longer ice-free shipping season in summer. Uh, ice will always come back in the winter, of course. Uh, some, perhaps some um, longer growing seasons, some modest gains in agriculture, uh, and milder winters, which are especially significant um, for biological life. Well, let me follow up on that. Animals and plants, you say, plant life as well, is already migrating northward. Explain. Yes, um, this is a, a remarkable outcome of uh, the research, not of myself, but of many biologists that have been studying this for, for years. Uh, on average, the plant's mobile uh, species, plants and animals, or the planet's plants and animals, are migrating northward to higher latitude or higher elevation uh, uh, at a rate of about six and a half kilometers per decade, which may not sound like much, but that translates to five and a half feet per day. So imagine stepping outside of your home each morning to see that your lawn had crawled north by five and a half feet from the day before. That's how quickly these biological shifts are happening now. And what are the implications of that? Well, for one thing, it brings uh, both bad news and good. It's bad news for northern species like polar cod and polar bears. It's bad news for the Canadian timber industry, for example, which is being uh, hammered right now by an infestation of the uh, pine bark beetle, which uh, ordinarily cold winters help to keep that pest in check. Uh, but we'll also see expansion of southern species and more generalized species uh, into the far north. Uh, animals like smallmouth bass and the Lyme disease carrying tick uh, beavers, these are all projected to expand northward and to become more densely populated within certain parts of Canada. Now, of course, 80% of the Canadian population lives within, I think, an hour or two of the American border. So we, got very, we have a few thousand people living up there. Do you anticipate that changing? No, not at all. In fact, uh, most of Canadians' population growth will be in her southern cities, Toronto, Vancouver. Uh, these are major metropolises, and um, uh, they are the biggest reason why... Canada's population is projected to grow by another 30 percent by mid-century, fueled primarily by global immigration flows to these southern cities. Uh, this, to, uh, combined with the, the really the successful integration, 
economic integration following uh, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement in 1994, is leading to a tighter relationship than ever between Canada and um, the United States. Well, Toronto and Vancouver are already pretty big cities, so you're yeah. looking at cities that are going to be much bigger over the next half century. Uh, implications of that are what? Well, the implications of it are economic growth uh, for Canada and, frankly, s a successful position uh, for Canada in terms of her ability to re successfully recruit uh, workers, skilled workers, from the global uh, worker pool. Like all developed countries, Canada's population is aging, and um, including the United States, uh, Western Europe, uh, Japan especially. Uh, as a result, by 20, it may seem strange now given the severity of the immigration debates, but um, most developed countries will be in competition for global workers by mid-century. And Canada has already uh, shown her success in attracting them and, and culturally even in, in welcoming, them, welcoming them, more so than countries like Russia, for example, which are quite xenophobic and are projected to have a population crash in the next uh, 40 years. Now, you mentioned in terms of uh, one of the four forces shaping civilization's northern future, natural resources was one of them. Uh, if, uh, I, you know, I can imagine people watching this right now are already trying to figure out how to load up on their portfolio on what the right thing's going to be. So what's going to be in the largest demand and the shortest supply as you look forward? Well, uh, as much as we'd all love to have cl be completely rid of fossil fuels by mid-century and port over to clean renewable fuels, um, under no foreseeable scenario will we be able to be completely off of fossil fuels by then. Um, so as a result, natural gas uh, in particular, oil will continue to be sought after uh, to the ends of the earth for the near future, hopefully not forever. Mm -hmm. um, that has near-term implications for Canada, um, not only in the Arctic, of course, but really with the tar sands, which environmentally destructive on the one hand, I've, I've flown over them. The tar sands, they, they look like Mordor, they really do. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they've been an economic boon uh, to, uh, to Western Canada, uh, fueling tremendous economic growth in Calgary and Edmonton, you know, two, two uh, opposing sides of, of the coin. We can expect to see continued uh, growth, or demand rather, for these resources in response to the historic rise of prosperity in uh, Asia and China and India especially. Now, Lawrence, you get to more movies than me, so I want to make sure I got the reference right there. But Mordor, meaning like something out of Lord of the Rings, is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, Lord, Lord of the Rings, okay. uh, that uh, just... Exactly. Gotcha. Okay. And one more follow-up here on population, because if, in fact, the North ceases to be as harsh a place to live as it is today, and you can do more up there, you know, longer shipping seasons and so on, uh, why would we not assume that more people are not going to migrate up there? Well, I'd, we shouldn't overemphasize uh, the, that somehow, you know, a milder winters are going to transform this into a wonderful living place. We're talking now about the Arctic. Uh, the winter will always return to the Arctic. It will always be crushingly cold. Um, so most of the population growth occurring there will be driven by uh, Canada's um, Inuit and First Nations peoples, which are enjoying over the last several, um, really since the 1970s, are now wrapping up a wave of sweeping comprehensive land claims agreements that are returning political power to them. Uh, and as a result, although they still face many, many struggles and, and societal problems, Things are looking up, and their population demographics are, are turning around as a result. The, uh, the age structure of Nunavut, for example, uh, the population there is the median age is half that of the rest of Canada. The uh, birth rates are twice that of the Canadian average. So it's a small number of people, but it's growing very rapidly. Gotcha. I know one of the things Canadians take a great deal of pride in is that I, I think we've got more fresh water here than any other country in the world. How do you see that changing over the next half century? Well, um, Canada is water wealthy, uh, like most other North countries, uh, relative to, well, where I live in Los Angeles, for example. Um, most climate model projections suggest that precipitation in the far north will increase somewhat. So uh, Canada, Canada's water riches um, will probably get, if anything, better. On the other hand, um, most of those rivers are in the far north and they fly, really, they, they flow northward to the Arctic Ocean unused. And in the, in the Canadian prairies, it's actually quite water limited with um, a, a fair amount of irrigated agriculture and strong dependency on, on rivers fed by, uh, long rivers fed, fed by melting ice and snow. Okay, Lawrence, one of the things I guess we've got to figure out right now is you've laid out how you see the world unfolding uh, towards the year 2050. And I guess people have got to know whether or not uh, this is good or bad. I mean, obviously it's going to be different uh, but different better or different worse? I'm glad you asked that question. Um, the, 
it, I really strove to take a balance, neutral approach with this book and lay out the big trends and lay out the facts and trajectories as objectively as I could and let the reader make up their own mind as to putting, attributing value judgments uh, on these things. I really don't, don't let my personal feelings seep in, in until the very last page. But uh, I will say that it's complicated. It's not as simple as just one winner or one loser. It's really a debate for Canadians to decide, for example, uh, whether the environmental damages of tar, tar sands development are worth the, uh, the economic uh, boon or not. It's a, it's a, uh, all of these are complex issues, and I hope that people will, um, can benefit from the neutral presentation of these trends uh, from there decide what kind of world do we want. Sure, but you do point out that the change will be I don't know if cataclysmic is too strong a word, but it's going to be awfully significant. I mean, unlike anything we've seen in our lifetime so far, I guess. And if that's the case, then presumably issues like security and stability start to come into play. Now, no, Canada that, has a long history of, of being a relatively stable place to live, but do you think that's under threat given the changes you've described? In the global context, uh, I argue in the book that the northern countries, these eight, one, eight northern countries in particular, uh, stand to benefit overall relative to the stresses experienced by the rest of the world. Whether that's something to rejoice in when that benefit comes at such, uh, um, with such problems for everyone else uh, you know, is a matter of, of debate. But uh, on balance, I argue that this new north will be very important to the world in the coming century. Uh, how important insofar as I mean, are you anticipating that the, the traditional power players of the world right now, and you know, I'm talking the United States, China, uh, let's talk about some of the developing countries, India, Brazil, are they going to be less significant and you see these northern countries uh, emerging in a kind of a powerhouse way that they haven't before? I certainly don't, I'm certainly not projecting anything like the power centers gravitating from China and India, for example, uh, to Canada and Iceland, nothing of the sort. What I am suggesting is that this historic rise in prosperity in China and Asia and India, along with their serious environmental stresses, will stimulate this new north into existence. And the new north will become increasingly important to essentially supplying uh, and stabilizing uh, this, uh, this growth in other parts of the world. But presumably, if we do better, I don't know, you tell me, is this world a zero-sum game? Somebody else has got to be doing worse? And if so, who is it? If we're talking about economic growth, of course, there is no zero-sum game. Uh, in theory, uh, all economies and prosperity can grow. And that is the trend that we are seeing uh, worldwide. So I don't think this should be viewed as a zero-sum game, but more of a rising uh, importance of northern countries to the world as a whole. Now, this message, uh, you know, you say you've put it out there as a neutral message and you want people to make up their own minds. But, uh, I mean, clearly I can see how some people in the environmental movement who have a lot of skin in the game of trying to convince people that climate change is evil and we have to do absolutely everything we possibly can right now to stem it, uh, yours is not exactly a welcoming message to them. Have you heard from them yet? Well, the truth is, uh, when people read the book, they, they realize that uh, I show how on balance the overwhelming, um, mo most, most the impacts of climate change are overwhelmingly negative uh, for the world as a whole and even, even frankly for some northern countries, for example, expansion of pests and so on. So I, I actually haven't gotten too much of that because most people when they look at the book, they, they, they see that we have a, a large collection of negative climate changes offset by some benefits in the northern countries. Can the climate actually change as much as they're anticipating in the next 40 years? Oh, ab absolutely it can. Uh, climate change is capable of very rapid swings. Um, from, uh, we've seen this throughout the geological record, and there's no question that the level to which we have already elevated greenhouse gas con concentrations are unprecedented. They're the highest they've been in at least 800,000 years, and probably not for four or five million years uh, ago in a geological past. And it takes time for the planet to respond to these changes, uh, owing primarily to uh, the effect of oceans which are more sluggish, but there's no question that temperatures will continue to rise on average and will, it, it's a decades and centuries long problem. See, I think the environmentalists would kind of rather have heard you conclude at the end of the book, there's absolutely nothing good that comes from climate change. But you haven't said that. You say there are some, obviously some positive benefits that will accrue to these northern countries. And I wonder if you're going to get into trouble with them as a result of this. It's hard to, I, I can't imagine why I'd get into trouble because I'm a scientist, not an activist. And uh, the, the, uh, I lay out the arguments, I'm relying on a lot of data and the studies of many very smart people 
and synthesizing an objective picture as, as best I can. I'm really not speaking to the values of it. And um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of downsides uh, alongside you know, some benefits in northern countries. How set in stone is the future that you've unveiled? Oh, absolutely not. The, uh, in fact, none of this is preordained. Uh, some of the trends are more unstoppable than others. Population growth and demography, for example, um, these our population future is for the next 20 years, barring some big uh, famine or disease, you know, are kind of wired in. Um, and all of the projections of this book are predicated on some conservative ground rules I lay out in the first chapter. I assume incremental foreseeable increases in technology, for example. That's not to say uh, some radical breakthrough in technology won't happen tomorrow and change everything, just that I don't entertain uh, that possibility in this book. So this is, what this book really does is it, it, it's not a prediction of the future to show how smart I or anybody else really are. It's more to show through logical extension, logical extrapolation of today's trends, where they are taking us if, should we continue as we are now. I understand that. So t tell me, for example, if the world, for, you know, for example, were to come together in an unprecedented way to do, I don't know what, fill in the blank, one thing differently than they're doing today, how could that change the future as you've unveiled it? Climate changes could definitely be curbed with a carbon tax and avoiding of coal. Those two things alone would go a great, a very uh, long distance to curbing some of these severe problems that we're talking about. But there are others. Uh, for example, a, rever a very um, interesting one, or potentially unstable one, is a reversal of the globalization trend, economic globalization trend, that has been underway really since uh, the Bretton Woods Summit at the end of World War II. Um, many of the um, outcomes projected uh, in this book assume a continued um, integration of the world economy. But there's nothing magical to say that that has to happen, for example. Uh, in World War I, or just on the eve of World War I, just prior to the outbreak of that conflict, uh, Europe was actually more economically integrated even than we are today. Yet um, the, that war showed how quickly countries could, in fact, uh, topple that integration and go to war with each other, uh, even if it meant gutting their own economies in the process. Hmm. So of the four global forces, I would say that one is the um, the most, it's most unclear as to whether it will actually continue. Lawrence, how old are you? 43. 43. So uh, in 40 years, uh, you know, all things being equal, uh, you're still going to be around. I'm not sure I will. I'm a little older than you. But um, why don't we say we try to do this again in 2050 and see just how well you did? I'll be 82 years old, so um, yeah, you might have to roll the camera to the bedside. <laughs> we'll give it a shot. Lawrence C. Smith, the geographer at the University of California, Los Angeles, author of The World in 2050, Four Forces, Shaping Civilization's Northern Future. It's good of you to join us on the line from L.A. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve.